Welcome to this tutorial on the use of the West Point Bridge Designer 2014 software. The purpose of the West Point Bridge Designer is to provide you with a realistic introduction to engineering design through the hands-on design of a steel truss highway bridge. The purpose of this tutorial is to get you started with the software, to walk you through the process of creating a design, and then to do some preliminary optimization of that design. And I'll finish up the tutorial with a quick overview of how you can then enter your design into the ongoing Engineering Encounters Bridge Design Contest, which will give you an opportunity not only to test your engineering skills against other students around the country and around the world, but also will give you an opportunity to earn fame, glory, and fabulous prizes along the way. So let's get started. When you start up the West Point Bridge Designer software, uh, this screen is what you'll see initially. And we're going to go through the process of creating a new bridge design. So that, that option is already selected. So all we need to do is click the OK button to start up the Design Project Setup Wizard. This is going to walk us through the process of setting up the drawing board that will be used for the creation of our bridge design. And we'll start out in step one of the Design Project Setup Wizard by simply familiarizing with the project that you're going to be called upon to solve. This is a steep river valley. It's 44 meters wide and 24 meters tall. And we're being charged with designing a bridge that will carry a four-lane highway across that uh, gap such that a standard highway loading can cross the bridge safely and such that the bridge itself costs as little as possible. That's the project we're going to solve. I'm going to click through this step, which isn't necessary for this tutorial, and move on to step three of the design project setup wizard, where we'll make some initial design decisions about the elevation of the deck that our bridge will have and the configuration of its supports, that is, the points at which the bridge is attached to the ground. Now, right now, you see the initial default configuration of the bridge has the span crossing the 44 meter gap all the way up at the top of the valley, which produces a span length of 44 feet. But we don't necessarily have to use that configuration. By adjusting the deck elevation by clicking either the down or up arrow buttons here, I can move the bridge deck downward all the way down to just over the water level. And you'll notice when I do that, the bridge itself gets considerably shorter. Now remember, one of our principal design objectives in this design is going to be to design a bridge that has the least possible cost. So initially you might think that it would be most favorable to bring the bridge all the way down to this level such that it would span would be as short as possible and therefore the cost of the bridge would be as low as possible. And while that reasoning is partially correct, You've probably also noticed that when we bring the bridge from the top of the valley all the way down to the bottom, we also have to bring the roadway from the top of the valley down to the bottom. And in doing so, we're going to have to do an awful lot of excavation to dig away all that hillside in order to bring the, the roadway down to the appropriate level. So the design decision that minimizes the cost of the bridge itself is also going to incur a substantial amount of excavation cost. On the other hand, if we have the bridge all the way up at the top of the valley, we minimize our excavation cost, but we maximize the cost of the bridge itself. This is one example of many that you'll experience when you use this software of engineering trade-offs. Cases where we have to make a decision based on two competing criteria. In this case, the two competing criteria are the cost of the bridge and the cost of the site preparation or excavation that's going to be necessary to build the bridge. For now, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about what the best alternative might be. Indeed, the only real way to determine the best alternative will be to try a number of different alternatives and evaluate the influence of those choices on the overall cost of the bridge. For the purpose of this tutorial, I'm simply going to choose a deck elevation that's right in the middle of our possible range, 12 meters above the surface of the water, which produces a span length of about 32 meters. Now, before we leave this screen, I should note that you can also use this step of the Design Project Setup Wizard to change the types of the supports that um, will be used to hold up the bridge. For example, I can add a pier in the middle of the river. I can adjust the height of that pier. 
And as you might expect, the pier probably increases the amount of support that the bridge receives, which might allow for a less expensive bridge, but the pier itself costs money. So here we have, again, another design trade-off. Rather than using a pier, I might change my abutment supports, those are the, the supports out at the ends of the bridge, from standard to arched, such that we can design a bridge that now has an arch shape of various heights, as you can see here. Now we can only do one alternative in this uh, tutorial, so I'm gonna stick with the standard abutments at a height of 12 meters above the water level, and let's click next and continue. At step four of the design project setup wizard, we can choose from two different deck materials and two different loadings. For the purpose of this tutorial, I'm simply gonna stick with the defaults and move on. Now here's an important step. Step five of the design project setup wizard gives us an opportunity to select something called a standard truss template. A template is really just a guide that will give us an opportunity to connect the dots, if you will, to follow the geometric arrangement of a standard highway truss bridge design in order to ensure that our structural model that we're about to create is stable and capable of carrying load. The standard truss templates really just show the geometric arrangements of various standardized types of truss bridges, like the Howe through truss shown here, the Pratt through truss, which is very similar, except the diagonals go in a different direction, the Warren through truss, which has a different pattern of interconnected triangles to make up the bridge, and then a series of deck trusses where the truss structure is actually below the roadway rather than above it. For this tutorial, we're gonna try that Warren through truss and click the next button. And at this stage, I can add my name here. And when I do that, my name will appear on all of the uh, printouts of the design that I um, can produce once I'm completed. So now we can click the finish button and we are transported to the design window. This is the drawing board. This is the place we're going to create a structural model of our truss highway bridge. Now any truss type structure consists of two different types of structural elements, joints and members. The joints are the connections where the various elements of the structure come together. And in actual bridges, joints are typically made up of steel plates and bolts and welds in order to ensure that the bridge has the greatest possible amount of structural integrity. We're going to draw the joints in our structural model using this tool, which is already selected by default. And indeed, the West Point Bridge Designer has already done about half of our work for us because it's already placed the first nine of those joints in the proper positions at the level of the deck. So in order to uh, complete this step of the design process, I only need to position my mouse over each of those very light gray circles that are displayed on the template that we selected earlier. Click the mouse one time in order to place a joint at that position. And now those additional eight joints are in place and we're ready to move on to the next step. And by the way, along the way, if you happen to make a mistake, for example, click the mouse accidentally and place a joint out here in space somewhere, you can very easily undo the damage by simply clicking the undo button up here on the toolbar, and that last joint simply goes away. Now that all the joints in the structural model are in place, I'm going to add the members. The members are the steel or wood elements that actually form the rigid framework that constitutes a truss. To add members, I have to change tools. So I'll select the member tool up here on the floating toolbar. And you'll know you've made the correct selection when your mouse changes to a pencil. Now I'm gonna draw members by placing the uh, mouse over one joint, then depressing the left mouse button and holding it in place. I'll then drag the mouse to the next joint following the little gray lines provided by the template. And when I'm over that second joint, I'll release the mouse button in order to draw the member. And you can tell you've drawn it successfully when you see the very heavy solid gray line uh, replacing the light gray line of the template. Now I'm gonna continue following the guide of the template, click, drag, and release. Click, drag, and release all the way across the truss from one side to the other. After you've practiced a little bit, you'll be able to do it quite quickly. Now we've finished up all of the diagonals. I still have to draw what are called the top and bottom cords of this truss. And in order to save a little bit of time, 
I can actually draw a single member from one end all the way to the other, and the West Point Bridge Designer will break them up into the appropriate number of collinear members. And then we can do the same thing across the top, and we've now completed our structural model. Now, before we go on, you must certainly have noticed over here on the right-hand side of the screen that as we were drawing structural elements, additional lines were being added to this member list on the right-hand side. Each of the lines in this table represents one member in our structural model. So for example, if I click here on member number one, you'll see that that corresponds to the left diagonal member over here, which is now annotated with a little member number one so that we recognize we're looking at the same element, both in the graphical representation and the list on the right-hand side. You'll also notice that this member and all of the others that we've created in this truss are composed of a material called carbon steel, abbreviated CS. The cross-section type is a solid bar and the size is 140 millimeters. Now, why are we using those sizes? Well, in this case, we're just using them because they happen to be the default values that the software starts up in. We have no idea whether those are really good choices or not. At this point, we simply accepted the default. Well, how do we know if those member selections are appropriate or not? Well, we've got to test our design. And to test the design in the West Point Bridge Designer, we only need to go up here to the toolbar, find the little button that has the picture of a truck crossing a bridge. The tooltip says, run the load test animation. I'll click that button and we'll see our bridge now spanning that 44 meter valley. And we'll see the truck attempting to cross the bridge and we see that we have a problem. Well, don't get too discouraged. Engineering design is an inherently iterative process, and so we should expect to have to go back to the drawing board once in a while in order to get an acceptable design. To go back to the drawing board, I simply have to click the button immediately to the left of the load test button. You'll notice it's here. It says show the drawing board view. I'll click that button, and now when we return to the drawing board, we'll notice that there's one slight difference in the uh, depiction of the geometric configuration of this truss. You'll notice that the member in the center has small red bar annotations, which tell us that this member has failed. You can also see the same annotation over on the member list on the right, where we can see that this is member number 28, and it did not survive the load test. So we need to modify our design in order to ensure that it can safely carry that specified highway load represented by the truck in our animation. To do that, I'm simply gonna select the single member that needs to be changed, and then use the various dropdowns up here to change the member properties. Now, the easiest way to strengthen a member is simply to make it larger. Right now, we already know that by default, that member was 140 millimeters by 140 millimeters in size. That's the dimensions of the square cross section. In order to make it just a little stronger, all I have to do is click this drop down and choose the 150 by 150 millimeter size. So how well did that fix address our problem? Well, all we have to do is run the load test again to see how well we did. At this point, the truck enters out onto the bridge and now it crosses successfully. So congratulations, you've now created your first successful steel highway truss bridge design. Now, before we leave the animation, we should note a couple of aspects of the display. First, you've probably noticed that the bridge is changing color as the truck crosses the bridge, as the bridge carries load, and that there are two different colors involved. Some of the members have turned red and some of them are turning blue. You'll also notice that there's a variation in the intensity of color displayed during the animation. What's all this about? Well, first, red means compression. Compression is a form of loading on a structural element that tends to cause that element to get shorter. The member is being squashed. Blue signifies tension. And tension is the form of internal loading in a structural element that, that causes it to elongate. And so members that turn blue are in tension, they're being stretched. The difference in the intensity of color refers to the amount of load that those members are carrying. If a member is glowing bright red, that means that it is loaded almost to its maximum capacity in compression. If it's glowing bright blue, it's loaded almost to its maximum capacity in tension. If it's a very light anemic looking pink or white, 
it means that that member is not being loaded anywhere near its actual capacity, which probably means that it's somewhat inefficiently designed. Engineers would say it's over-designed. It's much stronger than it really needs to be. Well, why is this important? Don't forget that I told you that our two objectives in the use of the Westwood Bridge Designer are first and most importantly to design a bridge that carries loads safely, but second to design a bridge that has the minimum possible cost. This bridge, you may have noticed, currently has a total construction cost of $299,087. That cost was calculated automatically as we were creating our bridge design. You may even have noticed the numbers uh, being incremented as we added new structural elements and new joints. And by the way, if you want to know how that number is calculated, just click this little calculator button here and a window will open that shows detailed computations for exactly how that $299,000 cost was computed. I'll leave it to you to sort all that out and to understand more fully how the West Point Bridge Designer calculates the uh, cost of our bridge design. For now, suffice it to say that while this is a safe design, it's also a very expensive design. It's not particularly efficient. So at this stage in the process, even though we have a safe structure, we really need to go back to the drawing board and attempt to make our structure more economical. How are we gonna do that? Well, the fairly obvious first step in our strategy should be to find some of those structural elements, some of those members that were not glowing a bright red or bright blue and make them smaller. And we should be able to make them fairly significantly smaller without compromising the strength of the structure. How do we do that? Well, exactly the same way that we strengthen this member here in the center, all I have to do is select the member and then change its properties. Now, I noticed as the animation was running that all of the members across the bottom of the bridge were a fairly faint blue, which means I can probably make all of them somewhat smaller in order to reduce the cost of the bridge without compromising its safety. And since I have to change the properties of a whole bunch of different members, I'm going to use a special feature of the software. If I hold down the control key while selecting members, you'll see that I can select more than one member at a time. And so I can select all of the members across the bottom quarter of the bridge. Then I can go to the drop down and change all of their properties simultaneously. I'm going to try making them 100 by 100 instead of 140 by 140. So I make that change and you'll notice that the cost of the bridge did drop considerably down to $278,000. Of course, we don't really know if that change is acceptable until we uh, run the load test once again. So let's run the test. Now you can see that center uh, cord is going quite bright blue and in fact it's a bit too bright. The structure failed and as we can see um, from our annotations in the, um, the bridge design window, the two members in the center actually failed in tension. And we can tell that because of the little blue annotations on top of the structural elements. But we can fix that quite easily. I've once again held the control key down so that I can select both of those members simultaneously. And now we can increase their size to 110 millimeters and run the load test one more time. And now we see a successful design. And our design now is down to $280,000. So it's still a fairly substantial improvement over our first design iteration. But changing member properties isn't the only way we can optimize a bridge design. We can also change the overall shape of the structure. And the easiest way to do that is simply to drag the joints around with your mouse. I can, for example, move the center joints up like this, move the outer ones down like this, and then the ones in the middle, I can move a little bit down, and these a little bit up, and in that case, I was using the arrow keys on my keyboard so I could move the joints with just a little bit more precision. And now we've formed the structure into more of an arch shape. And, and the fact that you've seen many bridges out around your town that have this shape probably should tell you that that's a relatively efficient way to build a structural design. 
Well, let's test, but before we do that, you may recall that this member in the center, we had to increase from 140 to 150 millimeters. I actually think I can change it back to 140 now that I've changed the overall geometry of the structure. We can now run the load test and see whether that hypothesis is correct. Here comes our truck crossing the bridge. And once again, our design is successful. And now we've got the cost down to $275,947. So we've increased it considerably just by changing the shape of the structure. I would add that we haven't at all attempted to change the type of steel, though the software does give us the capability to choose from three different grades of steel. Carbon steel is the least expensive, but also the weakest. The other two types are stronger, but also more expensive. So here's another opportunity to play with one of those engineering design trade-offs. Is it better to use a more expensive steel that's much stronger or a less expensive steel that's weaker? Well, I'll leave it to you to try it out. Notice also in the center that every one of the structural elements can either be a solid bar or a hollow tube. Well, why would you want to use a hollow tube versus a solid bar? The answer is that hollow tubes tend to be somewhat more efficient in compression. They're more resistant to a unique failure mode that occurs only in compression called buckling. And to test out whether that's really the case, let's go ahead and run the load test one more time just to remind ourselves where the compression is occurring in this bridge structure. And of course, you can see that the entire top cord is in compression. So if we're going to perhaps get some savings by changing solid bars into hollow tubes, the best place to do that would be on the top cord. So I'm going to select all of these top cord elements. Once again, I'm holding down the control key so I can do multiple selection. I'm going to change from the solid bar to the hollow tube. And the first thing you should notice is that there's a huge drop in price, but of course, we don't know if that's really an acceptable drop in price until we run the load test. And in practice, the load test fails miserably. And the reason is because when you change from a solid bar to a hollow tube, you've taken away a tremendous amount of the material from the center of that element. In order to compensate for that, we need to use a significantly larger size tube. So I'm gonna to switch to a much larger size, Let's use 240 by 240 millimeters, run the load test again and see how we do. Now at least the bridge holds up under its own weight. And as the truck crosses the bridge, we have a successful design. And wow, check it out. We now have reduced our cost all the way down to $266,000. Quite a, an improvement from the initial cost of $299,000 that we saw in the beginning of this tutorial. Uh, but you shouldn't be satisfied with this result. In fact, I'm here to tell you that you could probably get another $100,000 off of this cost if you're persistent and observant enough um, in working your way through this iterative design process. For now, I'm gonna stop the tutorial though and leave the rest of the optimization process to you don't forget that not only can you change the shape of the bridge, not only can you change the material, the cross section, or the size of every single member in the bridge, but you can also change the starting point. Remember when we started up the design project setup wizard and we chose the deck elevation and the type of supports? Remember there are a whole lot of other options that you might wanna try out in order to achieve the most optimal possible design for your highway bridge. And now, before we conclude the tutorial, we should certainly save our design so we have it available for continued work later on. So I'm gonna save my design to a file on my hard disk. And now I can open it up at my leisure at some later time. And I hope, after you've designed your own bridge using the Westmont Bridge Designer, you'll then go to bridgecontest.org, the website of the Engineering Encounters Bridge Design Contest, an internet-based international engineering design competition that's based on the use of the West Point Bridge Designer software. In order to participate in this competition, all you have to do is go to our website, go to the enter item on the menu, and after you've familiarized with the rules and the procedures, click the register item, and you'll be taken to the registration page. 
On the registration page, if this is your first visit to our site, you'll want to start the registration wizard and it'll take you through a series of steps that'll allow you to register for the competition. I've already registered, so I'm simply going to log in to the contest website. I'll enter my password, which was inputted at the time of registration. And I will be taken to my team home page where on that page, I have the opportunity to submit the bridge design that I just created using the West Point Bridge Designer software. To do that, all I have to do is click the browse button and go to the place on my hard drive where I saved that bridge design and upload my design. And as I upload the design, notice that the team home page tells me not only what the cost of the bridge design was, but it also tells me that my current standing in the contest is 272 out of 357 teams. Well, I'm not doing so well so far, so I'm going to go back and do some more design work. I'm going to refine that design a little bit more, reduce the cost somewhat, and perhaps I'll be able to move up in the standings. And that's just the sort of thing that you'll be able to do after you've created your design in the Westmont Bridge Designer and have uploaded it to our website for judging in the Engineering Encounters Bridge Design Contest. That concludes this tutorial. I hope you enjoy yourself designing bridges and submitting them for the competition, but most importantly, I hope you learn a little bit about engineering design along the way.